Hello, lovely listeners. Happy Halloween and welcome to a very special extra episode of Knock Once for Yes. This is a bit of a departure from our usual content. Normally, we bring you true paranormal encounters and haunted history. But today, we're going to be talking about a completely fictional ghost story. And you might rightly wonder why. Well, of course, we're here to celebrate the 30th anniversary of the BBC TV Halloween special Ghost Watch, which, despite many people thinking it was real at the time, was in fact a fictional drama. But in the 30 years since then, it's become a part of both TV and paranormal culture history, as well as being a seminal experience for both of us. It was, you could say, part of our origin story. So we couldn't possibly let this anniversary go by without sharing the impact Ghostwatch had on us and in no small way put us on the path to creating this show that we've now been doing for six years. To the very day this episode will drop, in fact. We also had the great honour of talking to the man behind it all, Stephen Volk, writer of Ghostwatch and many other paranormal TV, plays, books and films, including the TV series Afterlife and the movie The Awakening, that we think are some of the best in the genre. But unless you happen to have been in the UK and tuned in to BBC One on Halloween night of 1992, you may not have any idea what we're talking about. So let's back up a bit and set the scene for just what happened on that gloomy October night. And be warned that if you haven't seen it yet, there will be a few spoilers. After all, this did air 30 years ago. I would love to start this recollection of Halloween 1992 with a nostalgic depiction of glowing pumpkins grinning in the windowsill of my childhood home as my family celebrated the season with apple bobbing and ghost stories around the fire. But the truth is, back in the 90s, Halloween just wasn't a big deal in many areas of England. It wasn't widely celebrated, and a lot of adults, including my parents, thought it was just a commercial invention to sell sweets and refused to buy into the idea at all. My lifelong love of all things spooky certainly doesn't come from a place of childhood Halloween nostalgia. If any unfortunate trick-or-treaters tried knocking on our door, they received a heavy carrier bag full of cooking apples from our Bramley apple trees, resulting in a lot of confused trick-or-treaters left lugging around a weighted sack for the rest of the night, wondering if they'd been treated or tricked and whether to dump them in the hedge or take them home for their mum to make apple crumble. Needless to say, our car got egged a few times. TV was very different back then, An evening TV wasn't generally the domain of my 11-year-old self, mostly because anything on after the five o'clock soaps was often frightfully boring. So truthfully, I can't remember how it even was that I came to be watching TV at 9.25pm anyway. It wasn't like today where we have TVs in different rooms of the house. There was only one TV. And after tea time... It belonged to my dad, as he decompressed from a day at the office by gently melting into and becoming one with the sofa until the wee hours when he would finally snore himself awake enough to go to bed. The thing about my dad, though, bless him, was that he didn't really pay much attention to what was on TV or whether it was age appropriate for any children that might be hanging around in the living room. I think he mostly used to slip into a kind of exhausted meditative state, something I can well relate to myself now in my own exhausted forties. So, after the nine o'clock news, he wouldn't have thought twice about leaving the BBC on for whatever was next on the schedule. Something about ghosts and, and Michael Parkinson. There aren't many nights from 1992 that I can remember at all, let alone clearly, but Halloween of that year is one of them. I was twelve, and my parents were having a dinner party at a family friend's house. 
After the dinner, the adults sat around the table chatting, and I took myself off to the living room to watch some TV and wait for them to be ready to go home. If you've grown up with cable or Sky TV and YouTube, with hundreds or even thousands of channels to choose from, you may scoff at the chances of landing on a specific program by chance. But back then, in the UK, most of us only had four channels to choose from. The straight-laced and well-respected BBC One, where you might expect to tune in to important things like the news. There was BBC Two, where the Beeb would air slightly more risque fare, for the BBC at least. A quick check for the schedule of BBC Two on Halloween 1992 shows that they dared air a programme, and at lunchtime no less, called the Organ Organisation Men, about the builders of the world's greatest church and concert organs. Ew, heady stuff. I'm sure hearts were racing across the country. There was ITV, which enjoyed a bit of glitz and glamour, with lots of game shows and frequently would show films. Fantastic, even if they were several years after appearing in cinemas. And rounding out the bunch was the imaginatively named Channel 4, or even just 4. Channel 4 was the youngest of the bunch, and it was all hip, trendy, and edgy. But on this Halloween night, it wasn't playing anything particularly hip or edgy, at least not at 9pm. It was playing something called Court TV, not something that thrilled me with excitement. Over on ITV, there was a film, but the film was Wall Street, not in the slightest bit spooky, Halloween-y, or indeed even interesting to a 12-year-old. And on BBC Two was a show called Testament of Youth, a drama based on the First World War memoirs of Vera Britton, something I might find quite interesting now, but again wouldn't have inspired 12-year-old me to tune in. And that left only one more channel. So, it didn't take very long at all to settle on BBC One, and a programme called Ghost Watch. I was very nearly put off, as it was hosted by Michael Parkinson, or Parky as he was affectionately known by the British public. And for those of you who don't know who he is, he was well known at the time for his current affairs programmes, but mostly his self-titled show Parkinson, where he would interview celebrity guests. He was quite dry, at least in my twelve-year-old eyes, a bit of a stuffy father figure, and not someone I'd normally watch. But to see him talking about investigating ghosts, and on BBC One, it was very much akin to finding yourself watching a nature programme hosted by David Attenborough about Bigfoot. Similarly, I couldn't believe my luck when I realised that what had been left on the TV by my softly dozing father was a programme about ghosts. I had had maybe a greater than normal exposure to ghosts compared to many 11-year-old girls in the 90s. I'd been inspired by children's books and TV such as The Children of Green No and Moondial, and also by all the castles and old creaky manors we visited as a family with memberships to the National Trust in English Heritage, whose locations all had a ghost story or two to share. As a prolific reader from an early age, I sought out books on the paranormal, the classic fare that all of us 90s era budding paranormal enthusiasts grew up with. The Usborne World of the Unknown Ghosts, and as many ghost almanacs as I could spend my pocket money on. All written by solemn professor types, pictured in black and white on the book sleeves wearing tweed jackets and puffing pipes, next to their accolades as graduates of Oxford or Cambridge University and their memberships of the Ghost Club or Society for Psychical Research. This rather middle-aged, stuffy representation of the world of the paranormal was largely what was available on TV as well. Not that there was much of it around at all in those days. We had ghost stories for Christmas, of course. Christopher Lee theatrically and wonderfully booming out M.R. James stories from a leather wing-back chair ensconced before the grand fireplace of some academic library or another. 
There was the occasional TV documentary on the paranormal. Members of the public dressed up in their Sunday best suits to be awkwardly interviewed in front of the camera about their unexplained experiences, whilst the same middle-aged, tweed-coated, pipe-puffing Oxford graduates tried to explain them, using the stone tape theory and creaking around ancient crumbling country piles sprinkling talcum powder around the floors. Eleven-year-old me eagerly soaked up every scrap of it. It was a world that held me in rapt fascination, but it wasn't a world in which I would ever belong. I was never going to be a middle-aged male, pipe-smoking, early retiree Cambridge professor. I wasn't ever going to be invited by a long-lost relative to live in a Norman castle like Tolly from the Children of Greenno, or find myself with access to bimble freely around the grounds of a haunted manor like Minty from Moondial. In fact, up until that point, the only women I'd seen depicted on TV in the paranormal world was the odd, slightly flaky and blue-rinsed, elderly medium claiming to be channeling Marie Antoinette, not a position I aspired to. So as I sat, as quietly as possible, trying very hard not to alert any senior family members to the fact that I probably shouldn't be watching something about ghosts after the nine o'clock watershed, I was blissfully unaware that I was about to have all those sombre professor tweed-jacketed, pipe-smoking, creaking castle preconceptions blown out of the water. No creaking gates, no gothic towers, no shuttered windows, Harky intoned matter-of-factly, gesturing at a wall of stacked TV screens that showed an unremarkable suburban house. Yet for the past ten months, this house has been the focus of an astonishing barrage of supernatural activity. I was prepared for the studio to now begin to trot out a revolving carousel of witnesses to be awkwardly interviewed for the cameras in a standard BBC format, so I was quite shocked when, instead, less than a minute into the programme, we were shown a clip of a university research video in which parapsychologists had allegedly captured paranormal activity on camera. The footage showed two young girls settling down to bed from the vantage point of a wall-mounted security-type camera. After one of them gets up to visit the bathroom, loud clanging noises start issuing from somewhere in the house, and the girls react with terror as they scream for their mother. From off-camera, objects start to fly across the dimly lit room, the clanging noises continuing unabated. The mother appears at the bedroom door to rescue the now hysterical girls, and as they all flee the room, the bedside lamp explodes, flickers once with a small burst of flame, then plunges the room into darkness. The footage ended and the programme sharply cut to a pre-recorded montage sequence of a mobile TV crew gearing up as though they are about to tear off and cover some news event of national importance. Van doors slammed as a fleet of mobile BBC vehicles peeled out, loaded with giant wheels of cable and decked out with banks of glowing monitors and control panels bristling with switches and dials. Floodlights flicked on to illuminate a nighttime suburban street. Groups of residents jostled behind low metal crowd control fences and cables ran like strangling vines from a BBC scanner van to an unassuming council house at the centre of the shot. I was riveted. Parkinson was joined in the studio by a youngish, well-dressed and even fashionable-looking, for the 90s, female parapsychologist who coolly held her own against Parky's somewhat obvious scepticism. We then saw beloved children's TV presenter Sarah Green, as she and an outside broadcast crew joined the family in an attempt to capture footage of the ghost, or at least its effects, live on the BBC. Along with Sarah was Craig Charles, 
immediately familiar and high in my esteem as the actor who played the character of Lister in one of my favourite TV shows of the time, Red Dwarf. Back in the studio, Sarah Green's husband, Mike Smith, himself rather famous in his own right, as he'd been the host of Top of the Pops a few years before and was involved in many other TV projects, manned a telethon-style call-in area in the studio. This seemed to me to be based on the similarly named Crime Watch programme, where viewers could call in tips about crimes and criminals at large that were featured on the show. The telephone number to call was even the same one used on Crime Watch, as well as on the Saturday morning children's TV programmes. Despite the surprising university footage, there was nothing at the time that gave me any hint that this was anything other than a live factual broadcast. Some of this starting sequence was lost on me, as was very often the way in those dark times of non-pausable and non-rewindable TV, I missed the very start, or at least wasn't paying attention until a few minutes in, so I missed the initial premise. This only added to the surprise, really, as I had, to begin with, just got the impression of a celebrity presenter, standard telethon-style setup, all very common for the time and nothing noteworthy. So it was only when I eventually cottoned on that I was actually watching a paranormal investigation that my ears pricked up. And with that, everything changed. Because this wasn't a slow-paced narrative that I was used to, of a fabled ghost wafting around a dusty country pile, pursued sedately and contemplatively by a fusty, academic-wielding talcum powder. This was Sarah Green. The Sarah Green that I'd grown up watching on telly, who I'd made Blue Peter Christmas decorations with. The Sarah Green who offered a gentle, understanding hand to the prepubescent among us, searching for something that spoke to our generation on Saturday morning live TV. She was relatable. She was one of us. And here she was, tearing around a haunted council house in London, getting stuck in with a camera crew, holding boom mics aloft, explaining infrared cameras to a public who'd never heard of such a thing, clambering on tables to retrieve potential evidence, heaving furniture away from the walls to follow unexplained noises, and doing it all in trendy jeans and some epic shoulder pads tucked under her official Ghost Watch Crew t-shirt. Back in the studio, the competent figure of parapsychologist Dr Lynn Pascoe walked Parkinson through the activity she had witnessed and documented. She played reel-to-reel -reel recordings of the disturbing voice that sometimes issued forth from the 13-year-old mouth of one of the daughters of the house. She explained how she had had the army test inexplicably broken crockery she talked about the Rosenheim poltergeist case and demonstrated the Gansfeld experiment. This was a whole different side of the paranormal, one that I had never seen before, and it was blowing my little mind. The action would bounce back and forth between the studio and the family at their home, but nothing much happened for a while. Even at 12, though, I had a strong feeling of anticipation. This felt like the calm before the storm, in a way that I've come to know and recognise from the real paranormal encounters I would experience later in life. And sure enough, it wasn't too long before things picked up, both on screen and in person. There was a commotion on the TV as the live TV crew could hear loud banging in the house, and this just happened to correspond with my parents' friend popping in to check on me. I was a bit flabbergasted as she got very het up about what I was watching, rushing off to check with my parents as if they would be horrified that I'd be watching such a thing. There was no dramatic storming in of my parents, so I have to assume that they were somewhat less bothered than their friend. She did, though, immediately begin calling the number on screen to complain, but kept finding the number busy. As she was doing so, a very tense situation was unfolding on what we were all assuming was live TV. Just as Sarah Green valiantly rushes to the aid of the children, 
cowering under their bedclothes from the onslaught of phantom noises, she's halted on the stairs by the studio crew, who plead with her to wait, because one of the girls has disappeared from sight of the cameras. There is an agonising pause, as Sarah wrestles with wanting to run to the children's aid, whilst the camera operators hunt for the missing child, until they alight on a corner of the landing, nearly but not quite out of the camera's range. And the whole nation's stomachs drop to witness the eldest girl banging on the heating pipes with the handle of what looks like a toy plastic mallet, caught in the act of creating a haunting. I remember feeling deflated that it seemed the poltergeist was nothing but a hoax. It wasn't long after this that my parents' friend finally got through to the on-screen number, giving them a piece of her mind, and triumphantly declared that it was all a hoax once she'd hung up the phone. Having just witnessed on-screen this very thing, I simply responded with a nod and a mm, of assent. I think she was expecting a bit more pushback, but my agreement left her little to argue with. I think she also expected me to change the channel, but there was nothing else on anyway, so I left it on, and with nothing to argue against, she stormed off back to the dining room. Now, I'm fairly sure that what went on in my 12-year-old mind at this point was, I'd just seen one of the children faking poltergeist activity. My parents' friend had called the hotline and been told it was a hoax, and that these two were related. I still thought it was live, and that the TV people had just found out it was a hoax and shared that with my parents' friend on the phone to calm her down. I'd been distracted for a while and so missed some of the ensuing drama, but my interest was piqued once more when the activity on screen began to pick up again. There was a dramatic moment as the parapsychologist realised that the calm footage of the children playing a board game with Sarah Green wasn't actually live. It was a replay of earlier in the evening. And then we were cast back into live TV where we found all in a panic. The cameraman was down, possibly unconscious. We could only see in thermal vision, and it was all getting a bit tense. Of course, this was the moment that my parents decided it was time to leave, and I was promptly ushered out of the door and into the car, as all hell seemed to be breaking loose on screen. Strangely, in the way that Fitz and I have so often over these past 16 years discovered our childhoods to have curiously parallel paths, I left the show at a similar time and with a similar perspective. I managed to watch long enough to see the teenaged Suzanne, so relatable to 11-year-old me, be discovered faking the banging pipes noises that the TV crew, the studio and millions of people around the UK had been eagerly, even gleefully, hoping for. I felt a sense of horror for the girl, at the consequences and ridicule that she'd now be subject to, and I felt disappointed. But even at that age, I knew hauntings weren't as simple as all that. Credit where credit's due, those books, and even the children's fiction I'd grown up reading about ghosts, were never so simplistic as to paint hauntings as simple, clear-cut things, where everything was either factually a ghost or completely explained away. There were always grey areas. Places where potential explanations didn't quite chase the shadows from the corner of the room. Places where the torchlight of cold reason can sometimes accidentally illuminate something even stranger, lurking in the darkness just beyond what you thought was your dressing gown on the back of the door playing tricks with your eyes. In short, I was wholly unconvinced that the girl's antics were all there was to this haunting, and if I'd carried on watching, I would have been proven correct, as the rest of the drama went on to ramp up in paranormal activity that was most certainly not perpetrated by the young girls. But I wouldn't know that because it was around this point that my mum suddenly realised that I'd been watching post-watershed TV unsupervised for quite long enough and hustled me off to bed. 
consequently, for both of us, Ghost Watch lived on in our memories as a bit of an enigma. At that age, the news reports and resulting media for Rory entirely passed us by. We hadn't seen Sarah Green disappear under the stairs of the haunted house, never to be seen again, so it was no surprise to either of us to see her back on the Saturday morning kids' TV show going live the next weekend. Ghostwatch lingered on in our minds in much the same way as an unsolved mystery. We wondered what had happened in the end, and whether there really was a haunting outside of the children's fakery, but not because we suspected it was a drama. And although this confusion over whether it was a documentary or drama caused such upset in the days that followed the broadcast, it certainly wasn't what occupied our young minds. What had struck a chord with us was simply seeing a side of the paranormal that we had never seen represented on TV or even in books before. It was a realm of action and personalities we related to, a place where modern tech and gadgets worked side by side with Sarah Green sensitively telling a true tale of a gentle and meaningful haunting she'd experienced herself. A place that involved normal people in a regular, semi-detached house, not an aristocratic family rattling around a creaky country pile. Of course, Ghost Watch shocked many people with its blurring of the lines between fact and fiction, so it's understandable that even today, remembering it sparks many conversations of who believed it was true and who cottoned on to the truth that it was a drama. But I think there's probably a whole generation of us for whom that didn't really matter and for whom the important thing was what it represented, a breakthrough in the way paranormal culture was represented on TV and a world that we could one day be an active part of. Which, of course, brings us to today, a day upon which we're celebrating six years in paranormal podcasting and 16 years exploring the paranormal together after a lifetime of unwavering interest in the field and our own stint living in a haunted house. It would be another 20 years before we got answers to some of the questions that had stayed with us since childhood, and longer still before we got hold of a copy of Ghost Watch on DVD. Although, in an odd twist, we somehow both remember having watched the ending before we bought the DVD. We both have memories of happening across a repeat on TV whilst channel hopping one day, something that we didn't realise until a few years later that we couldn't possibly have done as it's never been rebroadcast on UK TV. We seem to have stumbled across a strange kind of Ghost Watch Mandela effect and have often wondered if anyone else had experienced this. If any of you listening have, please do get in touch. Ever since we've owned a copy, though, we've joined in with National Seance Live, an annual tradition started by Rich Lorden, Ghostwatch superfan, and director and co-producer of the documentary Ghostwatch Behind the Curtains, in which fans around the world all set their DVDs to play at 9.25 exactly on Halloween night, the time of the original airing, and tweet along whilst watching. And this year, we're also looking forward to an extra Halloween treat, as a new limited edition Ghost Watch Blu-ray is dropping on the 31st of October. There are loads of extras in the limited edition version, including a 30th anniversary documentary, film commentaries, limited edition booklet containing, amongst other goodies, a short story by Stephen Volk, a reproduction of the script and a set of six art cards. Needless to say, we have this on pre-order, and we are very excited. But now, we are just as excited to bring you an interview that we've wanted to do for a very long time. But it's taken us six years of podcasting to feel that we could do it justice. We're absolutely thrilled to bring you our interview with the writer of Ghostwatch, Stephen Volk. Mr. Stephen Volk, thank you so much for taking the time to speak to us today. We're so happy to have you on. 
My pleasure. Now, of course, we're here today in celebration of the upcoming 30th anniversary of Ghostwatch, and we couldn't pass up an opportunity to celebrate something that was so inspiring to us during our formative years. And you've also worked on many other projects as well, including TV and films that we hope we're going to get a chance to speak to you about later on, as well as theatre productions and authoring many books. But throughout all this work, I think it's safe to say that there's a definite paranormal theme. So let's start at the very beginning and ask, where did this interest start for you? Well, um, as you might expect, it's quite a complicated and winding road. But I think the question really, I think, at the back of people's minds when they ask that is, have you had a ghostly experience? That be- Because they can only contemplate really that it can be born of some creepy experience that they would want to explore these things. And that is not really the case, to be perfectly honest with you. I grew up, I guess, first of all, enjoying comics. And then I graduated from comics into, you know, pan books of horror stories, that kind of thing. And from then into, I guess, ghostly literature. So I kind of came to the whole subject through ghost stories in a kind of literary sense. Just they were stories that excited me and kind of thrilled me and spooked me. And it just was a kind of imaginative realm that I found myself relating to. We could go on a whole tangent about why certain people are drawn to certain genres, both to write in and as reading material or watching material. I think that's quite an interesting conversation we could have. But in my case, I think it was just a, if you like, a kind of sandbox to play in that I found endlessly kind of rewarding. And I guess when I started writing in my teens, I had a different kind of approach than I do now in my 60s. Um, I guess I apply a whole lot of different experience and kind of knowledge and I was going to say insight, but that would be rather pompous. (laughs) (laughs) I guess just skill really over the years in knowing what I'm about or trying to trying to explore what I'm about. But I guess I guess taking the bull by the horns that is implied in your question, I, it, it came from really a love of ghost story literature from the 19th century and the 20th century and supernatural fiction that really excited me. It took me out of the realm of, I guess, the normal, which has always been rather kind of boring to me in terms of storytelling. Yeah. And that is something we can absolutely relate to. I mean, yes, we have had paranormal ex- well, experiences that we can't explain for sure. But I think it's safe to say for Fitz and I both, we, f- we came to the paranormal and our interests were sparked a long time before that happened when we were reading ghost books growing up and, you know, the Usborne Book of Ghosts and the yeah. M.R. James style ghost stories. And I, I was collecting ghost books from about the age of six or seven. Yeah, so Fontana Book of Ghost Stories and that kind of thing. Yeah. Well, I, the same for me, to be honest with you. I graduated from that to being interested in, you know, it, you read about fictional ghost hunters and ghost mm-hmm. stories, then then you become interested in people that were actually ghost hunters and ghost uh, ghost investigators, exactly. like Society for Psychical Research. And funnily enough, that that being kind of contemporaneous to the fictional, say Sherlock Holmes, as a character that I always loved. You know, I think the SPR started what, what was it, eighteen eighty two or something. Mm-hmm. So it's it's not a completely different realm than. Baker Street and, yes. and uh, Lestrade and that whole lot. And, and and it kind of, with a lot of the TV shows, like the rivals of Sherlock Holmes um, that I grew up with in the, in the late 60s and 70s, it all became much of the same thing. There was a lot of supernatural fiction on TV, but be it horror anthologies and that kind of thing. So it was a, it was a very exciting kind of realm with a lot of material out there, actually. Um, and a lot of translation from kind of literary um, supernatural fiction into TV, which is a kind of British thing that happened in those two decades that doesn't really happen now. You don't Mm. really see classic era ghost stories appearing as new adaptations, you know. No. You see Mark Gatiss doing the ghost stories for Christmas. Mm -hmm. Yes, that that was so good. That's about about it, really. I mean, he's he's got it sewn up. So there was that. That was the kind of landscape that at the time when I was, first getting into writing this stuff. But I kind of also became interested in what went into real ghost investigations and what went into what experience people really had when Mm -hmm. they experienced ghosts. So I became, you know, I guess in my late teens, I started to read um, 
nonfiction about ghost investigations and, uh, as you know, got interested in spiritualism and looking into that and the history of the Fox sisters, how all that came about. It's such a such a rich world to, to kind of look into. And uh, so I guess there were two impulses. The first thing came from fiction, just finding the fiction interesting and then peeling that away and finding the real story of how he's uh, the real history of ghosts and the real history of psychical research and everything it became a real obsession to me, really. And that's, um, I, I must say, that's one of the things that really attracts us to your work, not just Ghost Watch, but some of the other things you've done. Ironically, it just, as people who've ex- had sort of real paranormal experiences or unexplainable experiences, your work more than so much else that's out there does capture that feeling of being realistic. <laughs> That's the most flattering thing you could say, I think. <laughs> well, we've been recommending your work unwittingly to people for years. Um, we've been recommending a, your TV show, Afterlife, and the film The Awakening to people for years. But the funny thing is, we only realised about this time last year that they were your work. <laughs> and then as soon as we did, well, the penny dropped and we we're like, oh, well, obviously. <laughs> that, yeah, that that's, why. <laughs> that's why we enjoy them. That's really them. funny. That's really funny. But we call them, you know, we say to people, we recommend them because they're what we call a proper ghost story. So, and what we mean by that is they they never descend into that, um, what we kind of call screaming demons. Yeah. <laughs> you, you never well, get well, that. You know, this is part of what I try and, and, you know, sometimes I might take on something and the very nature of it is, say, um, More parody or, or, or you're, you're having a satirical take on something mm-hmm. or you're reflecting culturally you know, you're being a bit meta about it. So I wouldn't say always, but if I'm if I'm taking the story where you're supposed to get immersed in, in what the characters are feeling, then I I think you're I feel duty bound to make those characters as real as possible with all the kind of fears and doubts that I would have if I'm in that situation. You know, people people that are not used to writing horror, for instance, say, How do you write that scene or how do you write that? How do you and it's kind of like uh it's sort of like 101 page one uh, writing for me. It's like, put yourself in that situation. Mm. What would you be thinking if something appeared in the corner of the room? You wouldn't just accept it. you know. And if you did accept it, then you don't have a ghost story. You have a fantasy. Yes. Okay. Uh, but if you don't accept it and there's a part of your mind doubting it, then you have that free song of doubt, which for me is the kind of engine of a ghost story in a character. If the character reacts against believing what they're experiencing then i think that that is the really important core to telling a ghost story i think really and 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 the rest of it is i mean this goes for ghost watch as well which is just making something which is implausible if not downright impossible believable mm. that is i guess the game if you want to put that in quote marks the game that i'm playing and i get enjoyment from in writing is to take something completely kind of you know, beyond normal experience. But for the time you're reading it or the time you're watching it, it feels like that is how people would be. And that is how people would react to that. And it's only afterwards that you think, oh, that's completely balmy or not right or whatever. But for that time that you're watching it, be it an hour, hour and a half or the, the time you're watch, you know, reading a story, you're, you're kind of living the experience with the characters as far as possible. And, um, you're, you're feeling what they feel, you know. And, and the important thing for me about the ghost story thing, coming from ghost stories, and I say this from kind of like the <laughs> the grizzled wisdom of age, I suppose, <laughs> as you look back at it and you've done certain talks to people like your good selves about, you know, what goes into these things. And um, and I think it's the kind of symbolism that's offered by a ghost, really. it's the it, it, That's what it really boils down to, is a ghost can be so many things metaphorically. Mm-hmm. It can be a a crime that you know an injustice that hasn't been exposed it can be it can be a way of talking about grief it can be a way of talking about kind of loss or many di- many different things you know depending what you want to do in in a story and that's in a way that was the template for afterlife there was um there was obviously Ariston, Alison and robert's character arc over the series but also each individual story uh individual people had their ghosts that had to be resolved you know and they each had their little bit of metaphor to address in each um in each story of the week as as we would call it in tv <laughs> yeah. terms and and that's that elevation from normal life where a paranormal or or a natural element comes into the story is always 
been what excites me about storytelling. Yeah, and I think that's what makes it so um, makes it resonate so much with us in all of those in Ghost Watch, in Afterlife, and even in The Awakening. That lack of separation between what's going on in your own life, maybe with your mental health, in you know the trauma that everybody has to a certain degree, and the supernatural happenings. You know, I think in the nineteenth century stories and in things like Ghost Stories for Christmas. The paranormal is very, it's almost very separate, even if it's happening in somebody's house. It's funny you should say that, because when I, I adapted a, a book um, for TV called Midwinter of the Spirit, I don't know mm. if you ever saw that, about no. a, um, a deliverance minister uh, played by Anna Maxwell Martin. She's a kind of Church of England exorcist. And when I did the pitch for, for adapting that, one of the producers said to me, so, as if it was the big question, so how do we do the supernatural scenes? And I'm like, what? <laughs> How do we do the supernatural scenes? And my first answer to the question was, well, I, I approach them in the same way as I would in afterlife. And, and it was kind of like, well, what do you mean? And I said, well, what do you mean? How do you do them? You do them by, you think of them from the psychology first of mm -hmm. the character. It's, it's all about the person that sees the ghost. Yeah. Once, you, once you've got that in your head, you can write the scene. So it's not about the ghost that appears. It's about the person doing the seeing. And this, this seemed to be effective because I got the job, but um, <laughs> it made me answer the question to myself in a way, which I haven't before, <laughs> as sometimes, sometimes happens, you know. But I do think that's the essence of it. it for me, it's, it's, um, it's not separate from the rest. It's, it's, it, there's no separation, really. The, the parapsychology is no different from psychology. It's, mm -hmm. just, it's just an extension of it. So that's how I, I kind of approach it, really. And, you know, in our experience, that is much more, that really reflects our real life experiences as well, that, you know, you don't, you don't have ghosts on one hand and everything else in your life on the other hand, the two are intermingled and you can't separate them. There is no clear line. So that we really appreciated that. Um, I think it comes through very much in afterlife, that kind of blurring of the lines. You're not quite sure what's paranormal and what's personal trauma and there's a there's a very indistinct line between the no, two which was... I'm, I'm really glad to, to hear that you don't pull any punches uh, no but it's <laughs> also not overboard either no no well i think it's in a funny kind of way if you're trying to make something that's spooky thinking of it from a real kind of almost commercial point of view or just achieving the effect point of view you don't really want the separation between something that's going to infiltrate reality and that reality which is why often when i'm uh watching a film with too much cgi in it mm -hmm. um i'm completely pulled out of the moment and it doesn't really affect me so much as something kind of innocuous almost stepping into frame or something if something's too much special effects too much makeup too much too ghoulish that yes. kind of over the top special effects makeup kind of thing it's kind of like get out of here that doesn't really it just doesn't affect me because all i'm thinking about is how did they do that how did they you know was that good wire work to show that figure flying through the air or was it and, yeah, and that was nothing so frightening as what we can make up in our own minds yeah mostly the absence of seeing the ghost is more scary yeah i mean i always think a, a, a great example for for me was um uh, you you guys won't remember it, but in the 90s, horror was very much, in the early 90s, was very much based around the Scream franchise, which is basically uh, very tongue-in-cheek, you know, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. teenagers being involved in getting scared to death. Oh, yes. Stuff. yeah, like, you know, It was kind of post-Halloween yep. genre boom, you know, and I was never interested in that kind of spookery, no. really. It, much as I enjoyed, uh, you know, certainly the first Scream was very cle very clever. But I kind of wanted to go back to basics. And it was only when The Sixth Sense came out that it really did go back to classical yeah. ghost storytelling. But the scene in that that I would I would use as a great example is where the woman uh, walks out of the kitchen and it's a kind of dialogue scene with her son and she walks back into the kitchen and all the all the mugs that are hanging on hooks are all broken. Yes. <laughs> and it's a continuous it's a continuous camera shot. So there's kind of normality that's been disrupted, but it's no grand kind of like uh, Mr. Scrooge moment. It's it's just something kind of innocuous that's, oh my God. I, and, and it gives you a shiver because it's just off kilter enough to spook you, you know? But again, it, it's so 
much more realistic. Mm-hmm. You know, when you're, if you are living with paranormal experiences, then that is mostly what happens. Like most of the time, nothing happens. And mm-hmm. very much that was reflected in Ghostwatch. You know, there wasn't much happening for quite a long time. Oh, yeah, Ghostwatch. that was a hard sell, trying <laughs> to tell them that there would be nothing happening for at least 45 minutes. But that <laughs> is what happens. <laughs> you know, if you were doing it for real, that's exactly, you wouldn't have any activity. Yeah. And it's just that, you know, it means it resonates so much more with us and our experiences. Um, the other thing about Ghostwatch I wanted to ask is that, um, you know, some of our listeners won't have seen it, but for those who haven't, I really don't think we can overstate how much it just broke the mould mm. on all paranormal TV. And obviously that's not really what you set out to do because you set out to write a drama, not <laughs> shape yeah. the, the future of paranormal TV. No, but... I wasn't. I would definitely wasn't thinking of Derek Akora no. and uh, Most Haunted <laughs> no. and uh, uh, Paranormal Detectives or whatever, whatever the subsequent show. Definitely that not. But, you, but uh, still, as an 11-year-old, well, 11 and 12 respectively, you know, that didn't matter to us. We didn't care whether it was a drama or not. The only thing we cared about was that previously, you know, we, we've been paranormal nerds since, you know, six or seven. So we watched yeah. paranormal TV. And it's much as you described earlier, you know, in the 90s, the paranormal TV we'd seen was old came old boys from Cambridge. It was academics, you know, middle-aged or late middle-aged academics running around, well, not even running around, plodding around um, creaky old stately homes, puffing pipes, tweed jackets, you know, it was, there was very much a stereotype. Or it was uh, Ghostbusters, don't forget Ghostbusters. Or it was, go- mm. or it was and, Ghostbusters. Uh, and the team in Poltergeist. I yes. I think those were the, those were the two pivotal uh, kind of ghost ghost hunter type characters, weren't they, in the 80s? And but, but certainly sort of on British TV, what we thought of as, you know, sort of real investigating, it was very much stuffy, you know, the, the realm of the stuffy academic. It's mm-hmm. not something that as an 11-year-old kid was a world that we ever thought we could be part of. And then all of a sudden, Ghostwatch explodes onto our screens. And we've got this young, female, fashionable parapsychologist, Dr. Lynn Pascoe. <laughs> I never we've... thought of that. I'd, I thought that, that I never really saw a straight line connection between it, really. <laughs> uh, well, I did see the straight line between kind of Most Haunted and Strange But True with Michael Aspel and all those kind of things. There was a certain aesthetic that ran through those things in the 90s. But, uh, but don't you think it was to do with the... Uh, ubiquity, if you like, of um, camcorders and really mobile kind of technical equipment that people could get very cheaply and could, you know, record their experiences and kind of... Yeah, I mean, we were sort of looking into the timeline of paranormal shows um, recently when we were doing some research for this episode. And we definitely don't go straight from Ghost Watch to Most Haunted at all. There was a lot of stuff in between. There was a UK TV series called Ghost Hunters, not to be confused with the US one. Which, again, it basically, after Ghostwatch, for a very long time, it just reverted straight back to the stuffy academic kind of um, oh, format really, right? again um, for quite, for about another eight or nine years. But that kind of made me even more curious, you know, with your background, you know, you say you, you've grown up reading like the M.R. James stories and the ghost stories for Christmas and seeing that more classic 19th century format. How did you get from that to what we saw in Ghost Watch, where it's all action. Well, I think that, you know, through the, over the years, I, you know, there are many things I I tried to pitch and get on TV, which which didn't work out. I mean, Ghost Watch started as a pitch to do a drama series about a kind of conventional society for psychical research mm-hmm. investigator getting involved with a a team of investigative reporters. Um, a kind of foot in the door, they used to call them reporters that are kind of in, used, used to be a show called World in Action, where they, it would be a kind of expose, a bit like Panorama is now, mm-hmm. you know, um, where there would be an expose of the week. And, uh, and and my thought was that there was a haunting in a block of flats and, and there would be a scientist investigating it. And there would be a kind of double act with a um, TV reporter was the idea, and it was called uh, that series was called Ghost Watch, um, and it was a conventional drama series. But we couldn't get it off the ground; the BBC mm-hmm. weren't interested. So in the end, I said, uh, or rather, the producer said, "Could we do it as a ninety-minute?" And I, I said, "Well, we haven't got enough. I can't shoehorn this kind of six-hour plot that I had in mind into an hour and a half. But um, why don't we just do the final episode?" And the final episode happened to be my idea for the final episode happened to be a live broadcast from a haunted house. So I said, let's do a live broadcast from a haunted house and pretend it's live. And she said, oh my God. <laughs> well, so I said, well, let's, let's, let's try it. It'd be a great thing to 
you know, it'd be unusual. And I never really kind of discussed it, I think, uh, with her at the time. But I was thinking really of um, The Stone Tape by um, yeah. mm-hmm. Nigel Neal, which is a big influence on me. I thought it was a great TV kind of yeah. event and it was really unusual. And, and there are many things that deliberate references in Ghostwatch to ideas in The Stone Tape, like the peeling away of levels of history so you get to something almost kind of like ancient and evil and and, and, and and how many levels of history do you are buried on this one spot kind of yeah. thing I, I wanted to get as a, the as onion a kind skin of homage to uh, <laughs> nigel neal i wanted to i wanted to get that in so getting back to your question through the 80s i was reading a lot about about um psychical research poltergeists you know i was i was I think at that stage i was a member of the society for psychical research so really? I'd go, uh, i was living in I was in, living in London, so I'd go down to South Kensington and see these lectures by people about ESP research mm-hmm. or levitation or God knows what it was really. And kind of, I was partly interested in um, what they were talking about, partly interested in just seeing what kind of people they were, to yeah. be perfectly honest, mm-hmm. and just hanged out with them and just getting an idea of what they talked about. Yeah. So I wanted to kind of, I'd seen those characters, as you say, in, you know, tweed jackets and sucking pipes being experts on TV, <laughs> be it in fiction or documentaries. But what were they like in person, you know? Mm. And I found that a lot of them were, you know, a bit like the scientist in Ghost Watching, that they might be, you know, quite an up-to-date woman in her in their 30s who's, who's a quite a serious-minded scientist, you know? So I wanted to... I definitely, in Ghost Watch, wanted that character played by Gillian Bevan to um, to come across as... as a proper psychical researcher. I didn't want to spoof her character, even no. though there's a satirical element in Ghostwatch, of course, itself. I didn't want her to be a figure of fun. Mm-hmm. Uh, but of course, what happens at the end with experts is they don't like they don't like that uh, no. <laughs> kind of approach. So I didn't get all the research I did into you know, and I talked to numerous male and female psychical researchers. You know, people that have worked on the um, Hugh Pinkott that had visited uh, the Enfield poltergeist and yeah. things like that, Guy Playfair. You know, I talked to a lot of people to try and get it right, both in the in the tone and substance of what the haunting uh, was. But did any of the members of the Society for Psychical Research appreciate that? Did they hell? They really layered into me in terms of um well, they didn't like it. Not many not many of them liked it anyway. That's a shame. Um because I think from certainly from our generation, obviously, back in the nineties, you tended to get more or less um, the, the paranormal world was kind of ruled by parapsychologists, and and that kind of um, that has changed now. You know, so many more people in the paranormal world are like us; they're just enthusiasts. We have day jobs, but from our perspective, as people that grew up with Ghost Watch, you got it bang on. Yeah, <laughs> you know, all that research I paid off. Is, uh, I think there's almost a kind of inbuilt or default feeling with paranormalists if you like parapsychologists uh, you know what well, the general term they're not all psycho- psychologists mm-hmm. by any means some are physicists and all the rest of it many different disciplines um is that tv gives them a bad rep and tv doesn't treat them with the respect they deserve which i think is partly true it's treated as a kind of semi-jokey subject a lot of the time but i don't think it's entirely true to be mm-hmm. perfectly honest no. i think sometimes you do get an investigative reporter into a paranormal subject that actually cuts to the quick mm-hmm. and actually gets to the nub of what is wrong with the research, mm-hmm. what is wrong with the observation. <laughs> and sometimes it cuts cuts through all the bull and gets to the real essence of it. And yeah. I think it's unfortunate that parapsychologists tend to be anti-TV mm-hmm. because TV has a massive, massive, massive resor- resource that if they could get it on side, would be a phenomenal um, coup. I mean, I, I, when I was making Ghost Watch, I thought, how cool would it be if the SPR made a connection to the BBC, let's face it, which speaks to the entire nation, yep. regularly gets, you know, at the, in those days, you know, Ghost Watch, for instance, got 12 million people watching it. If the, if the SPR, in terms of research numbers, could get to those 12 million people who view that stuff. And loads of people tune into the BBC that are interested in paranormal subjects. 
just on the basis of getting a massive database of people's experiences. Yeah. That would be incredible. Yeah, it would. Except that's what pees me off about <laughs> their reluctance to trust television mm. because there's just an untapped resource there that could really revolutionize the research if it was kind of embraced a little bit more, if you see it. I do. And yet you see, you see research that's done. I, I went to a conference the other day and someone was saying about research that they'd done and I was astonished to find, oh, we've only talked to about 25 or 30 people. I thought, excuse me, you're making <laughs> a, a theory about something, and, but you've only done an interview with 30 people. But anyway, I've got a so massive diversion here into into a subject well, no, that I'm sure no, you're not that interested in. No, it's not a diversion at all. I mean, we've you know we we do very much feel the same. Um, I think a lot of people in the parapsychology realm are very reluctant to you to embrace things like TV, media, even podcast and podcasters. And I think that's a shame. I think you're completely right. It's an untapped resource. And whilst I can understand their fear of not being taken seriously. I think if they were a bit more willing to sort of just take that one step, you know, that kind of leap of faith, yeah, yeah. I think they could actually do a lot to overcome that. I'm a little bit in danger of, of sounding negative about the whole, that aspect of it really. And I shouldn't be because I've got, you know, I've got people I consider friends in it, like Kieran O'Keefe is a lovely guy and he's always been a great fan of Ghostwatch. Mm -hmm. So I do appreciate that. Um, then there's uh, Richard Wiseman, who was, been really kind to me and invited me to the Edinburgh Science Festival to talk about ghosts and ghost stories. Um, and he's he's terrific. Oh, there's there's definitely a much more progressive movement in there. Yeah, but absolutely. unfortunately, there is still you know it, it's it's a divided field, which is a shame. I think it's it's got an it's got an inner um, uh, conflict, hasn't it? Yes, uh, naturally, in a conflict between believers and skeptics with. Maybe segues nicely into afterlife. I don't know. I'm giving well, you, I was funnily you enough. I was just you. about. I was just about to say, <laughs> off the back of that discussion about parapsychologists, <laughs> I have to ask: Did that that interaction, um, that response you had from the parapsychology, like the world of academia in the paranormal, did that sort of influence the way you then wrote your character um, in Afterlife? Because in Ghostwatch, the parapsychologist is really supportive of the family she desperately wants everybody to believe the family um she you know she's very much a believer although critical in thought and then in afterlife we have another sort of parapsychologist character coming more from the psychology side but he's very heavily skeptical really doesn't believe it and whereas dr lynn pasco you you get the feeling she really wants to believe you get the feeling that robert in afterlife is it robert yeah, yeah. robert in afterlife really doesn't want he wants to disprove it not prove it yeah yes i'm not sure there's a straight line because i was probably working on other things in between from 1992 was ghost watch and i probably wrote afterlife 1997 i think uh i, I mean it wasn't wasn't made until 10 years later but mm. I, that's when i wrote that's how long things take in television. <laughs> um, it, how it came about really was, again, I was researching, I, you know, I, I research kind of the paranormal subject as, as I go along. I like to keep tabs on, on what's happening, stories that are happening out there really. And I've always wanted, this harkens back to me saying I always love Sherlock Holmes stories and I've written some Sherlock Holmes stories, but I've always liked that aspect of Sherlock Holmes has a kind of story of the week, you know? Yeah. It always was really delicious to me watching TV in, in the 60s that you had a story <laughs> for a character, you know, uh, in those um, thriller and adventure shows in the 60s. It's kind of gone out of fashion now, but, but what I was thinking in the 90s was um, when I was pitching the idea to people that uh, a spiritualist medium being being in a way a consultant could offer you the same opportunity to have stories of the week because basically people she has clients the same mm -hmm. as a detective has clients and I, it struck me as a missed opportunity to do a, a, a supernatural show that could have stories of the week it, so it was kind of nagging me that yeah. that there wasn't one you know and it, as you know coincidentally there was another show called the medium i think that came out eventually at the same time mm -hmm. with another medium called Alison. It's it's complete coincidence because, <laughs> like I say, I'd written my script 10 years before, but these things have a weird kind of synchronicity about them. But what happened really was um, I went to a clairvoyant evening in uh, in Bath, near where I live, and 
I was watching someone perform. Can't even remember the name of the, of of the medium, and it kind of it kind of I didn't really believe terribly much what what was going on. I could see people were emotionally moved by the messages they were getting, etc. Mm. But I could also I also knew enough about psychology from reading yeah, and <laughs> cold Richard reading. Wiseman and cold reading and that kind of thing to know kind of how they did it in mm. a sense. And I'd actually been to a talk at Liverpool University that Kieran O'Keefe was partly involved in, which was called the Rhetoric of the Medium, and it was about how the medium uses language to talk to their clients to make them think they've had a really successful and uh, session full of hits. When、mm. in fact, if you analyze what they've said, it's mostly misses. But、mm-hmm. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> the client thinks they're hits because of the way the language is used. Yeah. Know? Uh, so that was absolutely fascinating, and so I was having had that in my mind when I was watching this this、uh, woman kind of you know perform, and I I came away with the feeling, what if you actually were very skeptical and you came across someone that you couldn't dismiss?、Mm-hmm. That really was the nub of it. What if you came across someone that that wasn't easy to dismiss and walk away from and go home from, <laughs> and then that that really was the springboard for the two characters. And I guess you know Robert's backstory about losing his son, that kind of thing. That all that came from wanting the clash of characters, yeah, and and the kind of journey that they would be on to. Really, really, it's a, I, you know, with the benefit of hindsight, I can see see what I was trying to do all along, which is sounds like I knew at the beginning, which I didn't. <laughs> But what I realised afterwards was that there are two people that are kind of wounded in different ways. And the other person can heal that wound. So Alison is kind of is she is she psychologically unbalanced? In which case, Robert's therapeutic mind could repair her. On the other hand, Robert is suffering from grief at the lo- feeling responsible for the loss of his son in the car crash. So Alison, being a spirit medium, can kind of heal his wound. So they could both actually, if they just. Allowed it to happen, they could both kind of heal each other's wound, and that's that's the essence of what I was trying to do the, through the whole thing. Of course, neither of them expresses that because they can't, which is part of the reason I hope that the drama works,、um, and and maybe the audience watching it doesn't really know that that's what's going on. But nevertheless, I think that was what kept it rolling in a way for me. Definitely, and then if we can just touch a little bit、um, on the film that you did, the Awakening. Yeah. Now, the Ghost Watch and Afterlife are both set in present day for when they're filmed, but、yeah. then in the Awakening, you take us back to the period after the First World War, which, as、yeah. history nerds, was very exciting to us. But I was just interested in what was exciting to you about writing about the paranormal, but from that period of history. <laughs> well, that's actually quite interesting. <laughs> Answer is probably not what you want to hear, but my original <laughs> version wasn't set then. Oh,、uh, it was actually set in the 1880s because my original version was a sequel to The Turn of the Screw. Uh-huh. Uh huh. I was teaching some screenwriters down in Kent as part of a performance arts lab, kind of like summer school type of thing. And one of the things was we had to show one of our favourite films and talk about it. So I showed the film. Of、uh, the Innocents from 1961, which is one of my favourite films, which is a brilliant、uh, adaptation of the Turn of the Screw. It's Henry James' ghost story,、uh, and I realised I'd seen it a couple of times before, but、uh, this time when I watched it, I realised that I don't know if you know the the story. Do you about the kids that are the two ch- the governess who moves in the into the big house called Bly, and、um, that she has to look after the two kids while they're The uncle doesn't really want to look after them, but it seems that the two children are possessed, or at least kind of spiritually influenced,、mm-hmm. by these rather dubious and corrupt servants that have died. The ghosts of. So what happens at the end of the second act, about an hour into the film, is that the little girl Flora is sent away so that the governess can confront the little boy, Miles, who seems to be possessed by the. Servant called Quint, and when I watched it this time, I thought, "What? What happened to Flora? We never have. We never knew what happened to Flora." So I thought, "I wonder what if she, as she grew up, she blanked out. What happened to Bly? Oh, I and see. And then she grew up and became <laughs> became a skeptic. Uh huh. 
And then everyone told her, everyone told her nothing had happened in the past. And then she'd called back to Bly, which has become a boys' school. And then she, the process of the film is that she realizes her real past was with the ghosts at uh, at Bly. So it's a kind of, I always feel that with ghost stories, you know, it's or paranormal stories. It's it's if you're going to confront this thing, is it going to be a a process of enlightenment or redemption, or is it going to destroy you? That's kind of the expectation of a, of a ghost story. Is it gonna is it gonna reveal something, or is it gonna reveal something terrible? And um, I always thought in the awakening, it should reveal something really positive that she can come to terms with something that was again a kind of wound from the past that mm. she didn't even know, know that she had, and it was about repression, repression of memory, and that kind of thing. So because it was, it was from the Henry James novella, it had to be when Flora Stroke Florence had grown <laughs> up, so the eighteen eighties, but various directors became involved in it and there was pressure from BBC films not to connect it to Turn of the Screw because I think from a commercial point of view it's it's like well if people have, don't know Turn of the Screw will they understand this mm. so mm -hmm. we had to ex extract it from that and um, the director that eventually made it I think he did a pass on the script that was very good in kind of making it um, embedded i think in the 1920s and, and made it kind of earn its place in the 20s and and she became very much a kind of character from that era and i'm very i kind of still have the ghost in the corner of my vision of what the film w would have been if it was my original thing but i still i'm very very fond and uh, enjoy very much the film that was made from it even though it departed from what the original concept was and of course, um, as a happy accident, well, a happy side effect of that for us, paranormal nerds, we get to see examples of all this cool sort of post World War One ghost hunting equipment mm -hmm. and the um, the the beginning part where with the spiritualist parlor. <laughs> oh yeah, that, I love I love bringing uh, you know it's the old it's the old Nigel Neal thing, which is bringing technology and science to bear on something that's magical and paranormal. You know, I think that was what really excited me about um the stone tape and mm. and, and the love kind of ghost hunt that, that that's the essence of ghost hunters really that really you know floats my boat which is kind of rolling this equipment setting up the cameras and yeah. you know there was another ghost hunter thing one of the rivals of sherlock holmes was uh karnaki the ghost finder oh gosh, i've never heard of that <laughs> Talking Pictures TV showed it the other week. It was Donald Pleasance uh, oh. played played the part, and uh, I watched this, and I uh, I thought, my God, this is absolutely embedded in my mind because you know <sighs> setting up cameras and you know trying to catch a ghost on film and this kind of thing, and the bringing the scientific mind to bear. It's like you know, it's funny revisiting something that m was such a kind of iconic if you like influence at the mm -hmm. time that you've seen it and just just filtered in and percolated into your own stories it was quite weird but i but i kind of love that clash between science and the supernatural i don't think that for in my mind any, anyway it'll, it'll never it'll never fade from being exciting in my mind oh and we would absolutely agree with you on that um so i think we're kind of probably coming to the end of our questions now but we wanted to pick your brains a little bit because obviously one of really the great joys of Ghostwatch and one of the things that has earned it such longevity, in in my mind at least, is because of when it aired uh, we, and we didn't have, you know, you couldn't rewind live TV, there was no social media and then it was swept swiftly under the rug by the BBC afterwards. There was a lot of almost like playground whispers, I want to say, afterwards. Yeah, yeah. And as a consequence, they just grew and grew over the years and Ghostwatch has essentially ended up with its own mythology. So while we've got you, and before we let you go back free into the wild, we wondered if we could pick your brains to do a little bit of myth busting. Okay. So the first myth, and I think this is at least partly true, is that the pre -record... Can I just say that I may, I may not give you the correct answer? <laughs> no, no. <laughs> but, but, you, but you can try me. We'd that's much rather have the truth than the correct answer. <laughs> No, if you don't know, that's completely fine, but we couldn't right, let go you go ahead. without trying trying to pick your brains. So the pre-recorded ghost stories that were featured in Ghostwatch, um, I believe that 
uh, well, the the myth as we understand it is that those were true ghost stories, or at least the accounts of people that had themselves experienced something. And um, also with Sarah Green, um, yeah. she was she wanted to do the show because she also had had an experience, like she says in the program. Uh, that's certainly true. Sarah Green's story is absolutely true. She she um, that wasn't scripted. Um, the guy talking about the saliva saliva on the front step that was true. And uh, Laura talking about something in her grandmother's house uh, that's also true. Which we Laura never got to hear no. because pipes no, interrupted it. <laughs> and, you know, Laura, Laura is actually a close friend of mine, so I I do keep uh, I keep uh, seeing her. In fact, it's her husband's. Uh, birthday as we record this by strange coincidence one day i i feel you may have to ask her if she'll release the story into oh, yes. the ghost watch hey, universe would that would be good for the, <laughs> because actually, every time be, we listen we watch it we re-watch that would ghost be great watch on for wednesday the anniversary actually. yeah exactly it, to write it down perfect be great. because every time we watch it we get to the middle of that story and we're like but we want what, to hear the rest of the story <laughs> <laughs> I definitely try and get it out of her and let you know. Excellent, <laughs> excellent. Um, also, as well as the stories that people were getting in touch with, um, as part of the drama, viewers call in and report that they're having experiences at home as well. And there, there's also a myth that this actually, like, as well as the sort of dramatised version, that people did actually have this happen and that they wrote or called in to the BBC to report having strange things happen during the programme. And do you know okay, if the, that... the ones that the ones that you see on screen were scripted? Mm. Oh yes, of course. Um, but there's long been however, a myth I that believe, it actually believe, happened. In, um, I as believe well. that when people rang that number, there were actually people from the Society for Psychical Research um, manning the phones. I think actually um, Maurice Gross was one of them. Really? Um, but I might be, I might, yes, I, I'm almost certain that he was one of them. And the brief to them was, first of all, to tell people it was not true and it wasn't happening. Mm -hmm. uh, second of all, to say, since I've got you here, what have you had an experience, a ghostly experience that we could record? I think yeah. that was possibly... Um, came from a conversation with me where I thought if people did ring in, you know, rather akin to the uh, proposition that I put earlier in the programme, you know, it would be a resource that would be uh, yeah. would be wasteful not to make the most of. Absolutely. So they were then asked if they'd like to share anything that had happened to them. Whether they shared something that happened on the night, I kind of doubt, but, but maybe if they had a predisposition to something happening to them in the past, they might have shared it with them. I never... I never really found out whether what happened to that in terms of any information that was given or recorded or anything, actually, strangely enough. So, <laughs> yeah, it's probably a bit late, 30 years later. <laughs> maybe it is somewhere. Well, maybe that was the... actually our last myth-busting questions was um, the whether it was true that some of the phone lines were manned by the members of the Society of Psychical Research. So, real. Well, as I far think. as I know, that was, that was true. That's what yeah. um, the producer told me, yeah. Excellent. Well, I think we, we can't really tie you down for much longer. I think <laughs> we've covered most of the things we wanted to cover, and obviously we could sort of chatter on We could for talk hours. all night, but we will try very hard not to, so <laughs> we perhaps better, we better call it before we really, you know, get, get deep into it and start nattering, talking your head off. Cause we could... okay. I can always come back and have another natter. <laughs> yeah, that would be cool. <laughs> We'd love to. Well, we're very much looking forward to see what you do next, because... We've we've loved pretty much everything that you've done so far. Yeah. So oh, what is next? Are there I any plans it. in process? Well, one thing I've got, I'm, I'm actually hoping is going to happen is um, I've just written a, a, a story, which will be in print rather than TV, but mm. it um, it's a follow up to Afterlife in that I've written a story about Alison set in 2022. Oh I, wow! Right now, that was one of those things that it's. I've obviously thought about the character over the years and disappointed that we couldn't continue it mm -hmm. but suddenly i think it was post pandemic i thought to myself I wonder what she's up to in bristol yeah. you know <laughs> did she volunteer in a vaccination center yeah. <laughs> these kind of things occurred to me really and i had a story on, on on the shelf that i thought would really work brilliantly with her um as part of it and um it came together in my mind really really quickly and i thought oh i'm not gonna i'm not gonna even think about this because Technically, I don't own the character. I have to get permission from Clark and Will Films because mm. they own it. 
So I, through my agent, I put in a question. Obviously, I know the people at Clerkenwell, and they're brilliant people, really lovely people. But I still, I, they still might say no. So I put the question in, and they said, "Yeah, of course, go ahead." Oh, Great story. excellent! So, um, so I've read that, and um, actually, funny enough, I've just sent it off to Leslie Sharp uh, to get her to read it. I don't. I'm a bit nervous as to what she'll make of it, really, <laughs> because she uh, she doesn't. Um, shall we say she doesn't hide her feelings <laughs> um, but you know she's also absolutely fantastic you know, fantastically encouraging and and absolutely completely committed to Alison as a character so I, I I really would love to have her blessing on the story mm. so that that hopefully will be in a book at some time so keep keep tuned and um You'll find out sooner or later. Oh, I really, really hope that happens because I will be thrilled to find out what happens next to Alison. Um, we we recently <laughs> rewatched both seasons of Afterlife, mm -hmm. so we, we're really invested. <laughs> oh, great. That's good to know. It's really good to know. Thank you so much. Well, thank you so much for coming on today. Um, we're really grateful to for you to take the time. And it's just been absolutely lovely to speak to you after, you know, really a whole lifetime Mm -hmm. of of ghost watch influencing our sort of paranormal interests <laughs> <laughs> it's been great to talk i've really enjoyed it thanks a lot excellent thanks thank you well we very much hope that you enjoyed that interview and our trip down memory lane as we reminisced over how ghost watch impacted us at such an impressionable age although i will say because it seems prudent to interject this here although we both watched ghost watch as children as did many other kids of our generation it's definitely not suitable for children and actually deals with some very adult themes. Which is why many viewers found it really quite terrifying. And we thought it would be nice to round off this episode by hearing from some of our friends and listeners about their memories of the broadcast and how it impacted them. And our first memory comes from Lucy. Hey, so just saw your Instagram post about Ghostwatch. And my story is that me and my sister were watching it upstairs in her room in the dark, age about, I don't know, 10 and 7. Didn't realise it was faked. The girl started speaking and the horrible, creepy voice came out. We screamed and screamed and had actual hysterics. Ran downstairs sobbing, mum and dad in absolute shock thought we'd seen a spider. So, uh, yeah, that's my experience. And thank you to Lucy for sharing that awesome anecdote. I'm sure <laughs> similar scenes were enacted up and down the country that night. And now we have another memory from a fellow Ghostwatch aficionado and podcaster, Scott Weatherly. Hi, Lil and Fitz. It's Scott from the 20th Century Geek Podcast. Uh, yeah, I wanted to just call in about the Ghost Watch. This 30th anniversary, well, I was there 30 years ago. I was there on the night it was broadcast. Um, I'll tell you a little story. So I was staying over at my grandparents' house. I had known this was coming. I think I'd seen something in like, the Radio Times or something. I didn't know much about it, didn't know what it, what it was. Uh, but I managed to convince them to let me stay up to start watching it. It was around Halloween. It was, you know, it was the done thing. So they, they, they let me stay up to watch it. I was 10 at the time. So it was a real sort of big win for me. Um, and I started watching this and I didn't know, my grandparents didn't know if this was real, if this was fake, what it was. Um, in fact, I, all I can remember is my grandfather, my granddad not being in the room. I think he'd gone off to do something. So I sat with my nan watching this program and about an hour, just over the hour mark, um, when things started to go a bit wrong, you know, I think there was a thing from when Craig Charles starts to interview the people out in the field, uh, in the street, and then they uh, start to go back to the house and they start to have this thing of pipes, start to sort of interact again. Uh, then my nan got nervous and said, you know, we should really start watching this, uh, stop watching this. Now the thing was, being 10 and having an imagination that was ridiculous, uh, it had actually already started to scare me. Uh, and so I sort of kind of agreed, oh, no, no, I should stay up and watch this, but yeah, okay. So I never saw the end of it the night it was broadcast, but I will tell you this. I went to bed that night. Um, I was put to bed and light went out, pitch black, 
and I was still terrified of this thing. Um, and that sensation of fear and stuff starts to you know, obviously swirl around you and you start to hallucinate things. And I was convinced, convinced that something was walking in my room. I could hear footsteps uh, in that room. That was what I was hearing. What I quickly realised was, though, that it was the pulse in my ears trapped, obviously because I was lying sideways onto the pillow, and I could hear that. But I was convinced it was steps in my room. Didn't sleep much that night. I remember then going into uh, school, the next time I go to school, talking about this. I have memories of talking about this with kids in class. Like how the, the talk wasn't whether or not you watched it. I think everyone had, had attempted to. It was how much of it you had been allowed to watch. Um, and it was, it was that thing. I think, you know, some, I think several people had watched it all and explained about the end and but everyone was convinced it was real. Like this, this was it for a group of kids, 10, 11 years old or nine to 11 years old. We were convinced that this thing was real and that, um, ghosts existed. Um, it wasn't until it was finally released, uh, by, uh, 101 on DVD, um, that I got it and I've watched all of it and I've sort of it brought back so many memories and it's one of those things that now I look back on it and um, it's so masterfully done and the choices that were made by uh, obviously Stephen Volk and the production crew to, to include these celebrities these personalities uh, Michael Parkinson um, Sarah Green and Craig Charles and all those that you sort of to me I recognise you know like I know these people from either Saturday morning television or something I know these people for doing specific things gave you that air of authenticity that I was like Sarah Green and Michael Parkinson will never lie to me this is clearly real um, and so it hung with me and and just watching it back I realised this is on the level in many cases you know of um, War of the Worlds which was obviously the Orson Welles, War of the Worlds from the 30s. Wonderfully done, fantastically done. Stands up as a uh, fantastic piece of television. Uh, and 30 years later, being released on Blu-ray, uh, really worth getting. And I think, you know, um, thank you to Stephen Volk for, for creating this show that's become a bit of a legend um, and a, a masterful piece of uh, British television. So, yeah, thank you, guys. And uh, if anyone else listening, please check me out. That's the 20th Century Geek. Scott Weatherly on the 20th Century Geek podcast. All viewers and listeners, welcome. Okay, thank you, guys. Thank you so much to Scott from the 20th Century Geek podcast, which you should definitely check out for sharing those memories with us. Now, that wasn't to be Scott's only brush with the paranormal, as he shared a story with us before on our regular show in which he had a pretty chilling paranormal encounter of his own. But now on to another listener who remembers that Halloween night of 1992 very well, Alan Tigwell, who wrote in to share his memories with us. Ghostwatch. Billed as a serious live paranormal investigation into a haunting within an average house in an average street in the suburbs of England. What put additional credence into it being something more sensible and serious than other Halloween shows were the presenters. They were the A-listers of British TV back in the 80s and 90s, being at a time before the internet and mobile phones, and more importantly, at a time before Most Haunted and the other plethora of ghost hunting shows, people were more innocent when it came to the paranormal. The more you watch ghost hunting shows or horror movies, the more desensitised to things of that nature you become. Ghostwatch was the first of its kind, so it was more of a baptism of fire for most viewers. So, this is the situation I found myself in back in 1992, when I was 18 years old. I was watching the show up in my bedroom alone, and my parents were watching it downstairs. I still remember hearing my mum scream when she spotted something in the background of one of the scenes. I remember being riveted to the screen, trying to spot the ghost from that point on, thinking it was all true. Although I was hooked, I also had goosebumps and was very shocked by what I was seeing. It wasn't until the final scene that it dawned on me what was really going on. To me, the ending was just that little bit too outrageous. 
By all accounts, many people had switched the TV off by that point, having been terrified by some of the earlier scenes. However, by doing that, they were left believing it was all real. It's no wonder so many complaints were made. In terms of the reaction by the general public, you could liken Ghostwatch to the original radio presentation of H.G. Wells' War of the Worlds. Having already been a fan of the paranormal, I would say this helped to fuel the fire of my interest in paranormal investigation. Thank you for sharing that with us, Alan. And in fact, Alan did go on to become a paranormal investigator and author of two books, Ghosts in the Garden of England and Collecting Ouija Boards in the UK, and creator of the most amazing talking boards over at the Ouija-torium. Do go and check out the Ouija-torium on Instagram. We're the very proud owners of no less than three of his amazing talking boards. And finally, before we sign off and get our cheese and pickle sandwiches ready for National Seance Live, we had to end with a final share that came to us via Twitter from a viewer who watched Ghostwatch for the first time only recently after hearing us talk about it on our main show. They said, Knock once for yes. I blame you for making Ghostwatch sound like a good time. It wasn't fun scary. It was scary scary. And I'm pretty far from a lightweight. It hit the same way the 1963 The Haunting did. Well done. Consider my ass kicked. Which I think is possibly the most fantastic recommendation of Ghostwatch you could ever hope for. And that's it from us today. Happy Halloween, everybody. And we'll catch you later at National Seance Live. Happy Halloween! <laughs>